Hey, this is Chuck from Metalwani, and I'm talking to Bill Steer of Carcass. Bill, how are you doing on this fine September afternoon? Pretty good, thank you. Yeah, I can't complain. <laughs> Excellent. So I was able to get a hold of the new Torn Arteries album a little bit early to do a review for Metalwani, and I absolutely love it. It's um, For me, it ranks right up there with Heartwork, because uh, that was one of my most favorite albums, basically of all time, but for sure of of what you guys have done, and I think Torn Arteries is, is right up there. It's fantastic. So thank you so much for this awesome new music. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you like it. I was wondering, I think you mentioned in Rolling Stone that when you, Jeff, and Dan are creating music, no matter how far afield you may roam, it, it's going to sound like Carcass. And I was wondering, what in your mind is the sound of Carcass? Well, it's difficult for me to say objectively because... Yeah, I mean, I'm involved, um, you know, I'm too close to it to, to sort of evaluate it in that way. But I'd say there's certain elements that are just cornerstones. I mean, we've always used the B tuning. Um, and that's not, not a big deal in today's world, obviously. But, <laughs> but back in the 80s when we started doing it, yeah, it was, you know, it was unusual to say the least. So that's one thing. Obviously, there's a lot of distortion going on. Um, there's Jeff's vocal style. Yeah. Um, there's certainly a style of riffing, but that covers quite a few bases. Um, we still do some things that sound pretty twisted and atonal, but there's a hell of a lot of stuff that's a little bit more melodic. Um, so you get those traditional elements, that, that style of riffing that, that actually has, you know, it could be quite syncopated or it could just be laid with harmony. Um, those are things that are maybe considered traditional or belonging to the past. But when you do it in the context of our music, I guess it takes on a darker feel, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, out of all the, you know, there's tons of great music on Torn Arteries, um, which one do you feel is um, the most uh, enjoyable for you, both musically and lyrically? And if you want to pick one that you love the lyrics for and one you want the music for, that's that's totally fine. Wow, that's tricky. Um, I think, I mean, there's several I could pick, but um, the, the first one that springs to mind where the music uh, still satisfies me as, you know, as, as a guitar player and a listener and a member of this band yeah. would be In God We Trust, just because that just seems to flow. Um, it's just a great drum groove yeah. that powers the song along. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the arrangement seems to just come together quite quite naturally. Um, there's just so many things about it that I like. <laughs> you know, I guess it, it just appeals to the, the kind of stylistic things that I listen for in metal music. Um, yeah. As far as lyrics, phew, that, that's tricky because even now I'm in the dark as to what some of the intentions were. <laughs> behind the stuff that Jeff wrote. You know, he's not the type to really discuss his lyrics, and that's fair enough, because I think yeah. he really wants people to, to arrive at their own conclusions. Um, like, like like any good lyricist, his stuff tends to work on a couple of levels. Right, right. You know, you could just do a cursory reading of it. Um, I might think about it's about something or other, but then <clears throat> uh, a deeper, lengthier reading would, would reveal something else entirely. Yeah. Um, I guess Down to the Stab is an interesting interesting lyric interesting idea yeah and it, it's fascinating how it combines with the music because the music by our standards is almost uplifting right? <laughs> it's one of the happiest <laughs> things we've done probably yeah but the lyric is is you know the, the subject matter is just something else entirely it, it's yeah you know, pretty unpleasant stuff yeah it seems to be a, a little bit of dark humor which i know is is a a Tends to be a little bit of a theme with Carcass. There's a little bit of dark humor. Yeah, it's been there from, from the first album, really. Yeah, yeah that, that's one thing that just runs through our, our uh, quote unquote career. <laughs> awesome. Um, I, if I understand correctly, I think the, the title for the title track, Torn Arteries, as well as the album, came from a demo that Ken Owen did, like way back in the day, like pre Carcass. And I was wondering yeah. what inspired you guys to use that as a title? I think it was just something that was lingering in Jeff's mind and had been for a while because I can't even remember when I told him the whole story, um, but it, it goes back to, 
our teenage years at school. And uh-huh. at this stage, Ken and I didn't know Jeff. That meeting didn't happen for another couple of years, I think. Okay. But, um, but yeah, Ken had come into school one day with his tape, and it was sort of a, a one-man band recording <laughs> called Torn Arteries. Um, it's long since gone missing, so... Uh, oh. Yeah, I just don't know where the thing is and <laughs> what it would sound like today. But at the time, it sounded extremely brutal and depraved because it because of the way he recorded it, because everything had just saturated um, <laughs> on the tape recorder. So it actually was just way more distorted than, than the original things he put down. I mean, he was recording with an acoustic guitar. Oh. <laughs> but the tape recorder was just so overloaded. It, it sounded enormous. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> um I was wondering, what is the the writing process like for you guys as a band? Do you um, like all get together and come up with riffs and put together songs, or is it um, more a process of where like you or Jeff or Dan will come up with a full song complete and bring it to the rest of the guys and say, hey, you know, what do you think and tweak it? How does that work? It's it's pretty much always the same. Uh, I'll go in with with some riffs um so sometimes it could be really you know just really sparse Mm -hmm. nothing more than 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 a few riffs other times i'll have large sections of music that i think flow well um but whatever i bring in um, however finished or otherwise i might think it is it will get worked on a lot yeah Um, because the level of criticism is quite high in the band so yeah, we spend quite a lot of time in the arrangements trying to, sometimes you, you try to trim the fat off things, you know, just make sure you've edited correctly so a song isn't too repetitive or predictable. And yeah. then other times you just need to flesh things out a bit and, and add something new. So, yeah. um, and that's always done between the three of us. I mean, Jeff's got very unusual ideas on arrangements. You know, he's, he can be relied upon to, to give you a completely fresh angle on what, whatever piece of music you've worked on. And Dan, he's a he's a great all round musician. Not just an amazing drummer, but he's a very good guitar player. Oh, cool! So his ears are very sharp too. Did you guys change anything up for um, the approach to torn arteries? Not really, except in the sense that the the standard was going to be higher. It would need to be higher, really, because um, every time you make a record, you learn a few things. Even if you can't crystallize what those lessons are, there's something you take away from the experience. Mm-hmm. And surgical steel was no, no different. Um, so all the years later, when we finally started tackling this record, there was just no way this was going to be the same thing. I mean, the music we were working on was quite different anyway. Yeah. But we just, if it was understood, it wasn't discussed at all. We, we needed to make a record that was significantly stronger and, you know, move things forward. Um I've said this quite a few times, but it would be inexcusable to to make a new record that didn't include new music. You know, it's got to, there's got to be something genuinely fresh going on. Yeah, yeah. I, I think one example of that's um, Ripping Flesh, Sonic Torment Limited, uh, which I love that yeah. <laughs> that title too. But that that song has a little bit of everything, and it's huge. It's like ten minutes long. Um, yeah, close to it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, did you guys? Um, was that one where you felt like the you wanted like this this more developed arrangement? Because it's got the acoustic guitar. It's got kind of almost a doomy pattern to it, you know, in sections. And then um, there's more more and you know like an, an anthemic um, ending. Is how did that one come together? Um, that took a while to complete because. We always viewed that as, as a song that was going to be a bit longer, simply because the original chunk of music I brought into the rehearsal space was, um, it was on a different scale from a typical Carcass song. Mm-hmm. There'd be longer passages before you had any repetition in the song. So at that stage, you already know it's going to be a larger, larger work. We just didn't really anticipate it reaching, you know, nine minutes 45 or whatever it became. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, we we do a little bit of crafting here and there in the rehearsal room, and then just leave it. You know, you, 
I don't know, yeah, you've got to trust your instincts. Sometimes you hit a wall with something, you think, well, another day we'll get this. And yeah. that's what happened with this tune. Cool. We went back to it a few times, and um, eventually we had something that we thought was going to be quite interesting. Um, you, you take a risk with a song of that length, of course. Some people are just going to drift away. <laughs> that's natural. <laughs> but it, that's part of the challenge, really, to, right. to do something that's going to be compelling and hold somebody's attention. Yeah. Did I, I know you guys... I. I believe that you guys recorded this pre-pandemic um, mm, and then held yeah. on to it. So was there any temptation to go in there and start tweaking anything because you had that uh, that length of time where you were, you know, waiting to get it out there? <laughs> well, that's a good question. And, and the honest answer is it never occurred to us. Oh. Probably because we spent so long on the album um, and we were happy with the mixes. So... It was just done. It had been done for months before the pandemic struck. Oh, okay. So we, we considered the album a closed chapter. We just we just couldn't wait to put the thing out there. Um, <laughs> as it turned out, we, we we did have to wait, obviously. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, right, guess, you know, right. There's a positive in there somewhere, I'm sure. Oh yeah, for sure. And um, speaking of you know that new album and them getting out there and getting the music to folks, the the Behemoth Arch Enemy tour got postponed until. Uh, next year um, but I know that you guys are playing Maryland Death Fest next year next May so I was mm. wondering if you have if there's any plans starting up now to do like a North American tour next year there might be I mean I've not been privy to anything any talk of this nature okay. I just assumed that we were too early into this this new phase now you know yeah. this kind of phase where some of the restrictions are being loosened um it seems like it's too early to really announce yeah we're doing a tour um because we don't really know the states in different places yeah. i mean the last I, I heard uh was that people from the uk could simply couldn't fly into uh usa and, and maybe canada too um so that would be one stage we need to get past Right, um, and then there's all the you know vaccine related stuff. Oh yeah, um, I'm sure over the coming months uh, there will be you know people looking into this <laughs> in some depth. I mean, we'd right. certainly be getting over there as soon as we're able, but I I can't realistically see see it happen for quite a while. I'd be yeah. surprised if there was anything before um, Maryland, for example. Yeah, yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. That, that would be around that next summer, maybe. Well, we can hope. We can hope. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I just try and stay optimistic. Yeah, you know? yeah, for sure. I mean, at least we got the music, and it's coming out, you know, 17th, so it'll be awesome. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. uh, so I had a question for you, just out of curiosity, as far as an origin uh, story, but what was the very first album you ever purchased uh, for yourself? And it could have been a gift, too. Okay. Um, well, I think... Uh, when I was very, very young, um, I seem to recall our parents buying an album for my brother and myself, um, which was just one of those generic albums that, that was kind of standard in, in the 1970s. Um, it was like a, I think it, it wasn't like a top 20 album. It was, it was like 12, you know, 12 England's biggest hits or something. Okay. Um, and <laughs> so, and that, and that was an era when those records didn't even have the original hits. They were, they were um, carefully um, sort of re-recorded by other artists, <laughs> you know, people who didn't have their names on the covers. Oh, it's, right. It was really odd. But some of, those, some of those compilations have gone on to be quite collectible because they feature people like, you know, like David Byron, who was in UI Heap, or um, Elton John. Yeah, you know, before they became famous. Yeah, but yeah, that's the first record I remember being given to a, to my brother and myself um, when we were tiny. The <laughs> first one I remember paying money for, I think, was the compilation Deepest Purple. Oh, cool! Awesome. Yeah, yeah. I had bought one record before that. That was Mozart, the Golden Years EP. <laughs> but that is an EP rather than an album. Oh, awesome. Nice. And so, uh, who who was your early influences? Like, as far as you becoming a, mus- a musician and guitarist? Well, those would be two immediately. Um, obviously, around that time, I, I, I'd seen the Woodstock film and Jimi Hendrix's appearance. Yeah. Um, there were, 
guitar players from from this part of the world that I also seen, um, whether it be on television or on, in films, um, you know, people like Rory Gallagher or um, Alvin Lee. Ten years after, yeah, um, yeah, and you know, bands that were coming through at that time that were quite new and exciting, like Saxon and Iron Maiden. Um, ACDC, of course. God, there was so much stuff. But that's around the period that I first really got into buying records and thinking that I would like to one day get a guitar. That's awesome. kind of where it started for me, yeah. That's very cool. What was your? Uh, what was the first uh, concert you ever went to? That was Iron Maiden on the Killers tour. Oh, really? Wow. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that's how old I am. <laughs> well, don't worry. I am, too. <laughs> I, I, one of my early, well, the first time I saw Maiden was uh, opening up for Rainbow in um, 38 Special. So I think it was 83 or something. Wow. Yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. That must have been a great show. It was. Um, it was It was super awesome. And then we then they toured with Priest. And so. That's right. Yeah. yeah. God. Wow. Yeah. It was awesome. It was, I mean, it was a, definitely, I mean, it was a fantastic time to be introduced to the world of live music. Yeah. It really was. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, obviously, there's great things happening in any era, you know, I, right. I don't doubt that for a second, but I, sp- I suppose I feel lucky that I was got to see some of those artists at that stage, you know, whether it's an Iron Maiden or a Thin Lizzy or an Aussie or whoever. Yeah. Um, and these gigs were big, but not massive, you know, they, they were in, in modest sized theatres, two or three thousand people, I would say. Oh, wow, cool. Um, and of course, the other thing, which lots of people of our vintage would mention is that um, this was a big deal. Um, People had waited weeks, if not months, for this gig and there was nothing to distract them once they were there. Yeah. (laughs) Everybody was watching the stage at all times. Um, It's, yeah, I think that's probably one of the things that does sap the energy out of a gig in today's world, or it can do. Yeah, yeah. When well, you got people that aren't necessarily paying attention and and yeah, I mean, yeah. the phone thing. I mean, it's given us so much, but you know, it, it's also a drag at times, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, I've been guilty of that myself, and I do some concert photography, and it's sometimes you just kind of uh, you think about the imagery as opposed to the music sometimes, which is you didn't do when you know back in the day. You were just there, right? So, um, yeah. Yeah, um, I have a question again, of sort of an origins thing for you, Bill, and that is, you know, you, you were listening to like Maiden and, and Priest and all these other, but what got you into like playing more extreme stuff that you, like that formed Carcass? I mean, how did you guys get the idea that you wanted to get that, um, that crazy? <laughs> mm, I think a number of things. In the musical sense, for, for people of my age group, initially it seemed like nobody could, could surpass Motet in terms of heaviness and speed. Yeah. And then Venom came along. You know, <laughs> that, that first record uh, just blew everyone's head off. <laughs> it, was like, it was just nuts. <laughs> You're right, um, right. It still sounds like that to me. It's just oh, a yeah. really exciting record, uh, yeah. which also happens to have great songs. So. Once that happened, you're aware that there was there was a new path, there was another way forward with his music, and then yeah, quite rapidly it seemed you, you had things coming through like Metallica and Slayer. Yeah. And then by that point, people like Ken and myself were getting into tape trading, so there was a whole underground beneath this stuff, which yeah. was even crazier. So that's really where you know the origins of Carcass lie, I would say. Awesome. And as for the lyric thing, well. I think we just observed that there were a lot of bands writing kind of vague stuff. Um, it was a little bit lazy, you know, stuff about zombies and horror films and whatever. Right. And um, Ken had actually written some lyrics of his own volition around that time, um, before we even had the band. We, you know, he just presented you with this sheet of paper and it was a bit like poetry, really. But you could see it would clearly work as a lyric in, a, in a, an extreme metal kind of environment. Uh-huh. So. That I don't know what his intentions were, but it Im- immediately became clear that this could be something we could build on, you know, because yeah. there was already this kind of very precise anatomical element to what he was doing. <laughs> so that that became our thing yeah. for those early years, really. 
That's awesome. Uh, well, Bill, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. I just oh, have I just have one last question for you, and that is, sure. um, what is your favorite breakfast food? Hmm. That's tricky because I don't tend to eat breakfast. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, don't, I mean, the first thing I would eat would probably, I mean, on a typical day, it probably wouldn't be until about two in the afternoon. Um, and that, that was, sorry. <laughs> 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 yeah, but, uh, yeah, that's a difficult one. I mean, probably, food, goodness. It would be something really nondescript, like a sandwich. Um, you know, it's, it's usually nice to have a pint of beer. Yeah. And, and a packet of crisps at about lunchtime. <laughs> so that would be my first thing, I think. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, that sounds awesome. What about you? Uh, for me, breakfast, uh, yeah. you, it varies. Sometimes I have like a, an egg sandwich. Um, oh, yeah. And other, sometimes it's like whatever's left over in the fridge. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good way to start, isn't it? Yeah, right. what you actually have at home. Right, right. <laughs> oh, awesome. Well, Bill, thank you. thanks again for um, talking with me and for the awesome music. Thanks, and um, can't wait to see you guys live. And I've got tickets for Maryland, so I'll, I'll see you there. <laughs> Fabulous. Looking forward to it. All right, man. Take care. All right. Cheers, Chuck. Yep. Thanks. Bye. Bye.